is always the case of nine o'clock. We ask that we may rise to our feet. And once again, we'll open up with prayer. And we'll see what the Lord is going to do this morning as we go into a whole new series of lessons. So shall we pray. Fathers, once again, upon this hour and upon this day, that we all here are so thankful, dear Lord, that you have allowed us to go from yet one week unto the next. And dear Lord, we ask blessings upon all those that are here and those that still truly may. You may grant them safe travels along the roadways, that they may arrive here with any harm coming upon their way. But now, dear Lord, as we come together as a group, as always, we ask that your spirit truly would be in the very midst of it all, that you would guide us, dear Lord, and direct us in the way that you would have us to go. We ask right now, dear Lord, for just a portion of wisdom from on high, that we all may be able to clearly understand this word that you have presented to us upon this day. For it's in the name of our Lord and Savior, the one we know as the Christ, that we give this prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, once again, good morning to everyone. I hope you all had a good week and looking forward to a, a good Sunday. And as is the case this morning, this morning we are moving into a whole new unit. We're moving now to unit number two of this our fall quarterly series of lessons. And to introduce this lesson today, we're going to kind of go back a little bit and go over mainly the titles, I guess you could say, of what we've gone through thus far. If you have noticed, everything that we have dealt with thus far in this quarter have dealt with things that, I guess you call it pairs, they go hand in hand together. Even though some of them may seem that they are opposite, but you still they find that they are hand in hand as the way they go. For example, some things that go hand in hand is the good and the bad, doesn't it? Goes hand in hand together. Just last week, we went to a, a wedding, and the preacher even gave those same words. He said, in this wedding, or this marriage, rather, he said, you're going to have some good days, and then believe you me, there are going to be some bad days. But it's those bad days that help you re really appreciate the good days. But the two go hand in hand together. We talked extensively each week in here about uh, courage and that of fear. We say they go hand in hand together because you can no way you can have courage unless you have actually faced and lived up to those fears that came upon you. And you'll find that many things go together. Uh, in order of our lessons, our overall theme for this entire quarter, these 13 lessons dealt with success and that of failure. We started off in the very beginning by talking about what success truly is. And it's not as the world sees it. The world sees success primarily as those who have finances, those who have money. But you'll find it does you no good to gain the whole wide world, but yet lose your soul. Well, we've learned that if you are in Christ, guess what? You're already a success. But also that title was success and failure. And oftentimes with the world, we look at failure as being that of a bad thing. But failure is something that actually you can use for your benefit. Because oftentimes, before you can be successful at some things, sometimes, well, you've got to fail quite a few times. But then you finally get there. But guess what? You can call it a good thing because now you learned what it takes to be successful. And you can tell someone, you might try that, but for me, it didn't work. And these are the reasons why. Because you have now gone through it to be successful. And that led us into our first units. Our first unit, you remember, was obedience and success. That was a simple message that was given. It pretty much was saying, or God was saying, that if you follow my word, if you follow <coughs> my statutes, if you follow my commandments, if you follow my ways, God was pretty much guaranteeing you that you would have this thing called success. And success truly was part of obedience. So all those first five lessons dealt with that subject. Those individuals who were obedient to God, and guess what he gave them? Success in the end such as the first lesson, it dealt with be strong and courageous. Two things go hand in hand together, strength and that of courage. This was a lesson that dealt with now how Joshua was given those words by God to be strong and courageous in this new position that he had as being the leader of the nation of Israel. And God told him that I will give you thus this land and God showed them that land. And I don't know if you guys watch the news. It's that same land today that they're fighting over at this very moment. Some of that same man, that's the, the path they took to get to where they are today. But you'll find that God said, this is the land I should give you. And at the end of the lesson, we saw that God had given them the land. And they received that land because of one thing. They were obedient. And therefore, God gave them the success. We move from that lesson to the next one of Rahab and the spies. Two things that go hand in hand together. But there are those who may not agree with that title. And there have been those. Rahab and the spies go hand in hand together. The prostitute. And the spies go hand in hand together. Well, yes, you're fine. They did. 
because you'll find that as they were going into this new land, uh, spies were sent out. And the spies arrived at a prostitute house by the name of Rahab. Rahab, you'll find that according to Scripture, she seemed to be the only godly woman there because this is a woman who told them that I know that Yahweh has given you the land. She said, I know what Yahweh has done for you on the other side of the Jordan in defeating the Egyptians. I know what God has done for you in defeating those of Zin and those of the land of Og. I know already that when you come over, this land is yours. The only thing I ask, she said, is this, is that you spare my house and my household. And you'll find for her obedience, guess what? She was successful. Because when they came over, they um, took all the land as possession. They conquered the city and conquered it completely. But yet she was spared because she was a God-fearing woman. This is why you'll find that in the book of Matthew, she is mentioned in the genealogy of Christ. This is why you'll find in the role called the faithful, the book of Hebrews, she is numbered with the faithful. This is why you will find in the writings of James, she is numbered as one. It was counted her righteousness by her faith and actions in hiding the spies. So she was a God-fearing woman. So guess what? The spies and this woman went hand in hand together and God had sent them there. We move from that lesson to deal with then the fall of Jericho. You can put those two together because most people in the Bible, when they think of Jericho, guess what they think of? The fall. They go hand in hand together. In this lesson, you'll find that some will say, well, what can you gather from this lesson? Because all it talks about is God had told the people that first of all, the priests would go out with the seven trumpets followed by soldiers, then followed by the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, then followed by more soldiers. Then God said, you are to march one time a day for six days around the city of Jericho, but don't say a word. But then he says, on that seventh day when you go around, you will march around it seven times. And after you march around it seven complete times, when the priests blow the trumpets, everyone is to shout, basically a sound of victory. He's saying the walls will fall and the city will be yours. And guess what? The city was theirs. So some say, what do you get out of that? Well, plain and simple, all it was showing us was this. The people were obedient. And by being obedient, they were successful because they did what it is God had told for them to do. And the city itself was conquered. Then we left that lesson of the fall of Jericho to deal with our next lesson with Ehod frees Israel. Ehod frees Israel. It goes hand in hand together because Ehod was a deliverer. Another name for a deliverer in this text was what? What was Ehod? I know you know it. They use that title, verb again, and they say, God raised up a deliverer. But a, de a deliverer in this text is what? When I tell you, you can say, oh, I should have known that. A deliverer is a judge. Remember, God raised up judges in those days. So they went hand in hand together. So you'll find that God raised up Ehod, and Ehod is the one you remember that came to deliver them, and he's the one who had that uh, dagger, uh, so what do you call it, a cubic in length, about 18 inches, and he stabbed the king in his stomach, and then he died on the floor and so on. Then he went back and rallied the troops, and they came and received the victory. So in other words, he was obedient, and they were therefore successful. Then we move from that lesson to the last follow lesson, which was God confirms Gideon's mission. Confirmation of the mission goes hand in hand together from God. As you remember, Gideon was the most unlikely of judges. First time we hear of him, he's hiding from the enemies, the Midians, uh, by thrashing wheat in a wine press. When the angel comes to him and says that, call him a mighty man of valor and thou shalt deliver the people, his words were basically, who am I? Just a poor man from Manassas, from this little family. He was a man who basically said his limitations uh, was already before him. In other words, he had basically committed to what he couldn't do by what he didn't want to do. Otherwise, God had told him, now you deliver the people. And his action was, who am I to do it? So the moment you say what you can't do, you have now limited yourself to what it is that you can do. But yet, they still used him. And he was a man of weak faith. Because you remember, this was a man that says, well, give me a sign first. Now, mind you, he's talking to the angel. He said, give me a sign. The angel's right before you. But you want a sign. So he placed a meal before the angel. And the angel touched the meal, and it was instantly consumed in fire. And he was somewhat a believer at that point. His faith had risen. But guess what? Before he went out, he said, I need another sign. And what's the sign I need now? He said, I'm going to take this, I'm going to call it a coat or blanket. I'm going to lay it on the ground. And in the morning, let it be wet with dew, but the ground dry. And you find that morning, it was wet with dew. He thought that was enough, but he said, no, wait a minute, I need another sign. He said, next morning, I want the ground to be wet, but the fleece to be dry. And guess what? It was so. And you thought then he would believe. 
But then before he had to actually go into battle, God had to basically direct him to go down to the enemy camp to see what was going on. And that's when he heard this uh, one Midian talk to another about a dream he had of a barley loaf, a, a piece of bread rolling down a hill and knocking over a tent, which symbolized they have lost the battle and that the uh, children of Israel have won. Then he became, you could call it, a believer. But God showed you that he took someone who was insignificant and made him great. But the overall thing to that was this. Gideon did not give them a victory. God gave them the victory. But by Gideon being obedient, they were what? Successful. So that's what those lessons dealt with. But now we're moving to a new unit. Our unit we're dealing with today is called disobedience and failure. Guess what? Two things go hand in hand together. Earlier, the first five lessons dealt with obedience and success. Well, now we're going the other right. We're dealing with disobedience and that of failure. But here's my first question for you. When we fail, who do we blame for it? It's yourself? Yourself? Sometimes others? Anybody else? Well, I tell you what, let me take those two. Wallace says self, which he's correct. Mike says others, which he's correct. Let's have a boat here. Which one do we blame the most, though? Ourself or others? Wallace stick with self. Wallace is probably speaking from personal point of view. Otherwise, you can identify with self. You know, some people looking at it, I blame others. So either way, you, you're right. But a lot of times you'll see with people, when something's wrong, oh, we're going to defend ourselves quick. I'm not the one that messed up. You messed up. You know, we'll point a finger quick at someone. You know, we all love sports, don't we? Yes. When our team lose a game, and don't bring up Denver losing by 70 points the other week, you know. But when they lose a game, you'll find that on the team, everybody says, this one messed up, this one messed up. It was a coaching. Everybody blames everybody else. No one steps to the forefront. And you'll find that, uh, with Dick and Fleming Morris, you said, the tree doesn't fall far from the stump. You'll find in biblical times, nothing had changed that either. Let me just bring up some, uh, some things I might bring up. Actually, I might bring this up during our congregational Sunday school uh, first of the month. But to, do, to introduce the lesson, let me go back. Remember we talked about uh, this man named Gideon just a minute ago? The most unlikely of judges? Now, you remember the children of Israel. When it came to the judges, let me just ask a couple questions real quick. Get your minds going. How long was the period of judges? How many years did the, did the judges cover? We asked this last week. Mm -mm. Y'all gave that answer last week of 42. Well, 40 also is what I said. Remember we talked about this? How many years was the time of the judges? 300 years. You remember that 300 years they, they did this kind of ride, you know, up and down, up and down. They, they follow the judge. The judge dies. Then they go back to doing the known wrong and so on from there. But you'll find that when you look at the book of Judges in the sixth chapter where I'm going to start at. I'm just going to give three verses, Judges 6. To go back to Gideon, look what they say here. It says in Gideon, I mean, let me slow down. Judges, the sixth chapter, verse 1 says this, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, who did evil? The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. I just wanted to point that point out. And give you a little tidbit because we've probably covered a lot of things in these couple of weeks. Israel is here is in, in the what? The wrong. Mm -hmm. They are definitely in the wrong. But we know in the world we live in, all the time we try to see Israel as being in the right. You might want to study this thing going on with Israel and Hamas at this very time. And what's all is going on there. And how Israel is always viewed as that of being in the right. But if you look at their history, Israel has oppressed Hamas greatly. And there the people have retaliated against Israel. And the world's looking at it like Hamas did the known wrong. Nothing's good about that situation at all. But I'm just pointing some facts out here. Gee, that Israel not always in the right. Just as pastor will often preach about America. American history, as far as the way they're trying to portray it now and banning certain books, we're always what? In the right. And doing the right thing. But we see way back, it says here, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Often in Judges, they would say these words when, they, when the judge would die. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. But he had done say that because this is early in their history. But it says then, in the sight of the Lord, it says, And the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Midian uh, seven years. Now notice it spelled Lord there, all capital letters. 
that basically speaks to the name of God. They're basically saying Yahweh um, is what they're speaking of here. So they live in those hands, all right? Skip over some things, go over into verse 12. Here's where the angel comes now to Gideon to speak to him. And he says these words, And the angel of the Lord, all capital letters, appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord, well, Yahweh, is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. We see here that he was chosen because he was a mighty man. Now, mind you, he didn't see that in himself, but oftentimes you'll find that God and others will see something in us that we don't even see in ourselves. So therefore, they came to him, called him a mighty man of valor. You think he would feel good about that. But look at the words that he says next. Very powerful. He says, and Gideon said unto him, O my Lord. Now, you notice there, see, King James, you have to really study and look at it. That word Lord is not spelled the same way. It's capital L, then it's lowercase. That basically speaks to a title of respect now that he has given the angel. He's not recognized as angels as being God, but he's speaking to the angel in the order of respect. He says to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord, now if you notice, it's spelled all capital letters, and now he's talking about God. He says, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befalling us? So if I, I may paraphrase, he's kind of like, I'm going to do it smugly, you know, he's like, Okay, if God's with us, why is all this happening to us? That's pretty much what he's saying to, the, to this angel here. Why then is all this befalling us? And then he says, and where be all his miracles which our fathers told us? So otherwise you're saying God is with us? Well, where yet? I ain't seen not one miracle. All I know of the miracles our fathers talked about, and we haven't even seen those. This is pretty much what he's saying. He says, did not the Lord bring us, us up from Egypt? So now he's going back doing a respective or going back in history, showing you way back then. He's so mighty, he brought us out of Egypt, but we haven't seen him in a long time here. He said, but now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. To read through it, verse 13, it says, and Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befalling us? And where be all his miracles which our father told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So he is saying that they are in the situation they are in now with the Midianites because of who? Because of God. Are we in agreement with that? Are we in agreement? I got y'all think. There you go, son. That's what he says. See, it's not a trick question, but I like, like the mess you guys get you think, get you double questioning yourselves. But what he says here is that I'm in a situation, or we in a situation we're in now because of God. But if you go back to the very first chapter, the very I'm not sure, the very first verse, you know what it says? And the children of Israel did evil, not hidden, it says in what? In the sight of the Lord. So in other words, you did a known wrong, and then you're being punished for it, but you're saying I'm at fault for it. And this is what I meant by I'm about to bring this up during our congregational thing. In heaven, uh, a preacher once said that to get to heaven, we have to go God's way. To go to hell, we go our own way. But you'll find that in heaven, God has rules. You'll be a part of God's household. He calls you to be what? Obedient. And if you are obedient, then you are successful. Just adhere to my way, adhere to my standards, and so on. If not, Christ said that day will come and I'll say to you, I know you not. In other words, you're cast out. We being made in what God's very image follow those same precepts because we're made in God's character and his image and likeness. Everybody here in your homes, you have rules, don't you? It's not a free fall, is it? You know, that's not a free fall. In your house, you might have things like, you don't come in here late out the hours. We're friends climbing through windows in or climbing through windows to get out. That doesn't go on here. You don't smoke up in this house and set my walls and things up. You know, there's no party in anything while I'm not around. But let's say, for example, this person now comes in all hours of the night, got people climbing in the windows and out the windows. They're smoking in your house, messing things up and partying. And you tell them, that's it. You got to go. And they, they're gone. But you know what they will say? In this thing called failure, they will say, I can't believe mama put me out. But who put them out? You put your own self out. But yet, the whole point is this. They have failed. But who are they blaming? Mm -hmm. That's the key. They're blaming somebody else. And that's always, in many cases, that's always, that's many cases, that's what folks would do. Now, now many times, yes, when you're at fault, you do the big things, say, well, hey, I messed up. 
But many times folks will point to someone else. Or they will say, well, I messed up. But it was because Brenda told me to so-and-so. It's like, wait a minute, how you throw my name in this? But that's what folks do, and that's what you find with the children of Israel will often do. That's what these lessons that we're dealing with now, we only have three, I think, short lessons in this next unit too. And it all deals with the individuals who were disobedient, guess what? And failure came upon them, all because they were disobedient. But this lesson here today starts out with um, Joshua, the seventh chapter, and we're dealing with the sin of, I'm going to call it a king, if they pronounce it that way. But that's what we're going to use. Now, this lesson starts off in Joshua 7, 1. But really, it goes before that. Because it says, but, right? And but is a conjunction that joins paragraphs or sentences or phrases together. And often that means a chain. So it's tied in with something else. What it ties into is, really, we have to go back. We have to go back to the lesson that dealt with the fall of Jericho. Now, this fall of Jericho, they were successful. But just as soon as they were successful, they've already failed. And what I mean by that, if you were to go back and look at that lesson, as we know, God had told them to um, soldiers go out in the front to march around the city, followed by the priest with the seven trumpets, followed by the Ark of the Covenant, and then more soldiers. And they would march around this thing. And they follow those instructions. And God said, you walk around it six days, one time a day, don't say a word. On the seventh day, you'll go around it seven times. And then the priest will blast the trumpet and everyone shout, and the walls shall fall and you shall go in and be successful. But what we have is what's not, well, what was not in that printed text. God gave them some other instructions also. He said, when you go in, you are to go in to sack the city, and you are to utterly destroy everything there. All the people, everybody has to go. Destroy them all. And he said, you are not to take up the accursed thing. The only thing you are to take, he says, is the gold, some silver, and iron, and these things. And these are to be placed in the treasury of the Lord. So you want to take anything for yourself because, you know, in those days when they would sack a city, you would also, what they call it, plunder the city. You take all valuable things and you could keep it for yourself. But here they couldn't do that. They had to carry it all to the treasury of the Lord. Any expectation of you, do you think why they would do that? Why would God not allow the people to take some things for themselves? But everything had to be put into the treasury of the Lord. Any idea there? Because it's, it's, it's different from anybody else. Any other nation wouldn't do that. They would plunder and take off your jewelry, your chains, your earrings, all that stuff. You remember when they left Egypt, it was the same thing. They gave them gold, wealth, earrings, and all. But why in this case, this was not the case? Why did God say, what you have to take is the valuable things, but they are going into the treasury of the Lord? Any idea? As I take my quick, quick drink here. Let me give you my rendition of this. That was dead to them. I will call it a test. Now keep in mind, nothing in Scripture says this, okay? This is what, my opinion, based upon my studies. It kind of, I would say, points to that or you could say alludes to it. The children of Israel were unlike any other nation, right? Any other nation. Every other nation had their own king and they had their taxation and whatever would go upon them and so on. They did defend for themselves and so on. But with God, it was different. All the way up to this point, who did they depend upon? God. What did all their needs, how were they taken care of? By who? How were they eating food and surviving? Everything was dependent, guess who, upon God. But yet if they get all this gold and silver and things of that nature, guess what they started to cling to? Material things, things that man has. So God let them know in this case, from what I can see by further study, is that you don't need none of this stuff. I'm going to take care of you. You'll find even with the children of Israel, when they received the gold and stuff from them, they used that to make things for the house of the Lord. They helped them build the temple. It was never put in the people's pocket that people became, you could say, wealthy or rich, because they always depended upon one person or one entity, and that was God himself. Of course, later, guess what they said? We want a king like everybody else. And God said, well, tell you what, they want that, give it to them. But tell them this, Samuel. When they get a king, this is what's going to happen. He's going to tax them. He's going to put them in wars. He's going to name all the stipulations, but they still wanted a king. But up to this point, God took care of them. And God said, be obedient to this, and you're going to have one thing, success. But guess what? There was one individual by the name, by the name of, a, of a king. When they sacked the city, he saw some things that he liked. And we'll get into those things uh, later that he liked, but he took these things. And he carried him back to his tent. 
and he mixed them with the things that he had, and then he also buried them in the floor of his tent. This is not scripture, okay? But this may have been the case also. It's quite possible that his family knew about this because you're all living in the same tent. You're digging up the floors or the dirt and whatever and, and hiding things. So the family probably knew what was going on. It plays an important factor as we go forward. But what we have here is that this man has committed this sin. And that what brings to the lesson we are today. God had gave them victory, but he gave them instructions on how to be what? Successful. But this one person went the wrong direction. And here's what happens now when it says, but, but the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. That's the thing they're not supposed to have been taken. It says, For Cain, the son of Carmi, the son of Zedai, the son of Zorah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the king of Israel. But I'm going to go back a little bit. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. Who committed a trespass? I got a cane over here, and I said, what, what did we say over here? The children of Israel. So who committed the sin? Somebody says a cane. The title of our lesson says the sin of who? A cane. The word here says, but the children of Israel did a sin. Who sinned? It's kind of baffling, isn't it? This is the thing that the naysayers, those who want to always challenge God's word, want to bring up. And this is the importance of having Sunday school because we get to talk about these things. The sin that was committed was by one person, a king. But that sin fell upon, guess what? All the people. And you might say, well, how can that be the case? That, that shouldn't be the way. Why should everybody get blamed for it? You know, it's like in sports. Junior plays soccer, you know, from this big all the way to college. But a couple of years, he played little league football. And he would come on and tell Linda in a heartbeat, I said, I want to this coach. I said, this boy messed up. And this man made everybody run laps. He said, why I'm running laps? See, he didn't want to mess in front of the ball. But guess what? It was a representation of the whole. You represent, it's like when um, anyone goes out, I guess, for your church. Or let's say an uh, associate pastor. Let's say it has to go preach somewhere. Typically, of course, times are changing with, with, the, with the new preachers out there. Before that associate would go forth, he had to get permission from his sitting pastor. Because when you go out, you're not only representing God, you're not only representing yourself, you're representing your church. So it's a direct reflection back upon said church. Here, you'll find that you have to look at a little bit earlier than this lesson. That's why you have to read things before and after lesson. Before this happens, as far as um, what a king did, they went into a covenant agreement with God. You know, God's come to agreement, that's binding. And that is that the people themselves would not commit any sin and do certain things, so on and so on. And if one person messed up, it was a reflection upon them all. So they all were to blame for it. So they were in a covenant agreement with God that if one person did wrong, we all are in trouble. So uh, it's kind of a case of each one need to, to reach one and watch one. Don't you mess up, because what you do over here can't affect me over here. It's no different than someone committing a sin. A lot of times that sin, it ain't just what you did. What you did now has affected everybody else. So here what God is saying by this man committing the sin, guess what? The children of Israel have committed a sin. God was different than any other nations. Other nations, they would get this, just that one person and they would put them out, execute them or whatever it may be. In God's house, he said, everybody comes up. So now everybody took it a little bit different because it's not just dealing with the individual, it's dealing with everyone. So it's like when you have a vested interest, or you're going to speak up for your vested, your vested interest. You know, so this doesn't just affect you, it also affects me over here also. So this is why God says, but the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. Because earlier they went into an agreement that this is what we as a people would do, which means they all came together. And the narrow thing there, it says, for a king, the son of Carmen, which was his father, the son of Zebi, Zeb, Zebdi, which was his grandfather, the son of Zorah, which was his great-grandfather of the tribe of Judah. So they nailed this thing down and said, this is the individual. And the reason why sometimes you'll see they'll give names, you know, grandparents, so on and so on, to bring absolute distinction to who they are talking about. Because as we have talked many times before, a lot of times they don't use last names. They use your name, your father's name. But guess what? 
Sometimes my name and my father's name is the same as this person over here. So they'll go a little bit further in the genealogy to point out that this is the one who we're speaking of. So this man here now is lifted up as the one who had done this evil. And by doing this thing, it says, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against not just him, it says, but the children of Israel as a whole. Because we learned back in, remember the last quarter, that God's ways are not our ways. Remember we dealt with understanding God's kingdom? It's totally different when the way man does it. God does it in a whole different format. And it says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore lies thy thus upon thy face. Now if you notice here, we have a jump. They go from verse 1 all the way to verse 10. But here's the thing. Those verses in between are important, but there's some things that happened before this. Because right now, Joshua is on his face praying, calling unto God. The question is, why is he on his face calling unto God? We say, well, this man took this accursed thing. That's what led to it. But what he's on his face crying about is something totally different. At this point, Joshua doesn't know this man has committed this evil. All Joshua knows is this. They have now come into um, the land of Canaan, right? They conquered this city called Jericho, right? Jericho is last right what we call, guess what, folks? Gaza. Fighting right, right today about this thing. Right in Gaza. But right beside Jericho is this another city called A. You spell it A-I. What goes on there is this. They conquered Jericho. They said, man, there's another little city, a small city, though. It says, send spies out to see what this is all about. The spies go out walls and come back and say, it's a small city. All we need is about two, 3,000 soldiers, and we got this thing. They said, that's all we need? Two or 3,000? Yeah. Joshua says, send 3,000. Otherwise, I'm going to send the biggest number. They go into battle rows. When they go into battle, guess what? This little small city has Israel now on the run. They've turned their backs, and they're running. They're getting the daylights beat out of them. I think 36 soldiers may have passed, and it wasn't many, but some soldiers died, and they ran for their life. And they come back, and the whole nation of Israel is in uproar. Like, what in the world has just happened? We've defeated the mightiest army in the world, which was the Egyptians by God's hands. We fought against those of Zin. We fought against those of Og. And we defeated Jericho. And this is the least of anything we face against, but we've lost. The problem is, they don't realize that when they was in Jericho, this man had let's call it stolen these artifacts, because you're basically stealing from God, because supposed to went to God. You have stolen these artifacts, hid them in your house, to the point that God said, because of Israel's sin, because it was a corporate sin, you all was in it together, you're on your own. God stepped away from them. So they didn't have God go into battle, and they lost the battle. Joshua doesn't know this. He's just saying, what the world has happened? So of course, he's upset about this thing. He's kind of like um, Samson. There's a powerful part in the writings of Samson that often is overlooked that should be talked about even more. I'll just give you the phrase of it. You remember the spirit of the Lord was upon Samson, but it came a point that it said the spirit of the Lord left him, and his word says this, he didn't even know it. And that's how they were at this point. God had left them, and they didn't even know it, didn't realize it. But it was a lesson for them. So at this point, Joshua being what, the leader? He does what he's supposed to do. The first thing he does, he go to the Lord about this thing. He wrenches his clothes in a sign of mourning and suffering. He falls on the ground. He's praying to God. And God comes along and says these words, And the Lord said to Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore lies thou upon thy face? God basically said, Get out that float. So what you doing lying on your face? In other words, something has to be done now about what's going on. Because remember, the anger of the Lord was kindled against this. God didn't like this thing. Not only did he... Uh, well, there's many things we can, we can add to this guy as far as breaking the laws about coveting and so on. But basically, you lied and stole it from God. I don't know if I can use that term, actually, God takes this personally. But you look at it, that's what's going on. You've stolen from the Lord and put all these people in danger. They're telling Joshua now, get up. Something's has to be done about this and done about this nail. So this is why he says, and the Lord said unto Joshua, get thee up. Wherefore lies thus thou upon thy face? God says, Israel have sinned. You see how he put it all together? He said, Israel have sinned, and they have also transgressed my what? My covenant. See, we have to go back earlier and read this thing. It was, it was called a corporate covenant. They went into this thing together. So when one's guilty, they all guilty. And keep in mind, when God gives his word, does he keep it? Yes. Mm. God let him know that everybody going to be in trouble for this. God could have said, tell you what, this man only do this we're going to take care of him. But God doesn't go against the word. He would already said earlier, the nation itself shall be punished for any of their transgressions. So God stays with that. He says, 
Israel have sinned and they also have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and dissembled also. And they have put it even among their own stuff. So what Cain has done, oh, God knows the details. He knows all about it. You've taken it. You try to be slick and mix it with some other stuff. It doesn't mean by disassembled. And then you're going to bury it like, oh, this is all mine. It's blended in with everything else. But God sees it. It's just like David, when he had committed his sin, he thought he was in the clear. But he said, but God saw this thing the entire time. So now, guess what? When you rebel against God, remember, remember the five hours? The next one is, guess what? Repercussions for your action. And God now brings this forth to the people. He says, therefore, the children, in verse 12, he says, therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were a curse. See, I had to bring up that thing about AI because that's what he speaks of now. He said, that's why you couldn't stand against your enemies. You went out to fight them, but God said, I wasn't with you. And that's why they turned their backs and had to run because they had did what they were not supposed to do. Even though we know it's this one individual, God looks at them collectively as a whole here. He said, because they were a curse. Neither, now here's where they get rough. He said, neither will I be with you anymore except you destroy the accursed thing from among you. So we see that it's happened to the people, right? They've been soundly defeated in a battle, 3,000 soldiers. Uh, everybody's in an uproar. Everybody's, uh, you could say, afraid, like, what has happened here? This is the smallest force we've ever had to fight. God said, there's a problem here. This man has stolen from me. It needs to be dealt with. And he said, guess what? If you don't deal with it, I'm cutting you off. If that isn't a battle cry for you to do something, you know, what's the saying? If God be for us, Mm -hmm. And I always twist that thing around. And if God be against you, who could be with you? Nobody's going to be with you. So he realized right now, my all in all comes from God. And God has told me, I need to do something like this and do somebody like now. And if I don't, guess what? He's coming down upon me. It reminds me of um, Jeremiah. And I often say this, say this to you in the past by Jeremiah. Is that, remember Jeremiah was afraid of public speaking? He said, I can't speak. I can't talk and so on and so on. And I always use that as a motivation when I first started doing things in the church because I was scared to get up and say anything. But God told him, say, get up and speak to my people. And he said, well, I can't do this. I can't do that. If you read that scripture in Jeremiah, God said, you better get up and do what I tell you to do. Say, you think you're embarrassed now. Don't do what I tell you to do and watch what will happen to you. And that's scripture. You look at it. That's what he's saying. He said, you better get up and do something. So here is a motivator by telling him, you better get up and do this work now and do it and among you. He says, uh, let's I'm read verse 12 again. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed thing from among you. Now, here's one thing we have to understand. Now, Old Testament is rough, isn't it? There's some violence in there. What goes on here now, it said, lest you de destroy the accursed thing from among you. What is the accursed thing? Miller, you got it right. The accursed thing is a king. But some look at it as he needs to find those artifacts. Remember, they call the things that he stole a curse. So some people look at it as he's supposed to find those things and destroy them. It's not the artifacts he's talking about. The accursed thing is the man that has committed the sin. He needs to be put away from among you. It's rough, but guess what? God had already told you, if you want to be successful, just be obedient. If you want to fail, be disobedient. Remember, this theme deals with disobedience and that of failure. He says um, in verse 30, I mean, I'm sorry, verse 20, now, I told you before, I'm not a big fan of lessons that's prepared in this fashion. I understand why they do it, but they skip over so much stuff. That's why you have to read it and understand it. And sometimes I myself can't jump over it because then you'll lose what's being talked about in between. But what goes on now, it says in verse 20, And a Cain answered Joshua and said, I indeed have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. So now we get this man's confessing. But here's how all the people get involved. What they do before this before this man of Cain comes, they call each and every tribe, each and every family, and they go through them one by one. Because God wants people to know the severity of the situation that they are now in. Even though this family haven't done anything, they're being called out. What he does is he calls each and every family out, and they question them about what has happened. Did you take anything from this war? And they're going, I don't know what you're talking about. No. Then they go to the next family and next family. Because remember, a tribe was made up of many families. And they would go through each and every one. But now they have gotten down to the tribe of Judah. Now, you can imagine Arcane's feelings here right now because he, he knows what's going on. You know, and the, and the sad part about it, if you look at it that way, is that they're going through each and every one, getting closer and closer and closer to him, that he's probably sweating in his boots. 
It's kind of like we were as kids when we would mess up and we would get punished and we would get out. We, we didn't get timeouts. We didn't get spankings. We, we, we were beat up. After you got your beat down, they say you wait till your mama get home. Or you wait till Uncle so-and-so get there. And all day long, you're sweating bullets. I wish I heard me get this thing over with because you know what you did. Here's the same thing. They're coming um, one by one through all the people, and then they're getting down to this individual. And when they get to him, he has but one choice. Because he, keep in mind, he knows God. And he knows that Joshua is the man of God, and God knows what's going on. So he confesses by saying, when he gets to him, keep in mind, he skipped over all that leading to it. It says, and Arcane answered Joshua. When Joshua asked him the question, have he taken up the accursed thing? And he says, I indeed have sinned against the Lord. He said the right words there because he sinned against God, which means he stole from God. He said, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. In other words, all the crimes that have been laid out, I'm guilty of it all. Then he goes on and says, when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, and 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, shekels weight. Then I coveted them, and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth, in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. We're not going to go into how much this was as far as dealing with weights and all that, because that time is running out. But he stole a substantial amount. And he stole these things. You'll find the words he gives, he shows he's broken several commandments. Because one is, thou shalt not what? Steal. Another one is, thou shalt not covet. And what he did? He covered it. He looked at it. He saw it. Then he took it. And then after he took it, Mike, guess what he did? He lied. Mm -hmm. He lied about it and hid it in his tent. And he knew it was wrong because he hid it. He knew it was wrong. He hid the stuff. But yet the crime now has been committed. It says, so Joshua sent messengers and they ran into the tent and behold, it was hid in his tent and the silver under it. So when he went to his tent, guess what? Everything that he had said was true was underneath there. But keep in mind, Joshua already knew this. Joshua didn't know who it was, but God told him that this man had taken the stuff and he's hidden in his tent. Now go through the tribes. He went through each and every one. So now everybody knows what's going on and why this come about. Another good reason for that is too, communication is key, isn't it? If this man was just taking out the camp, him and his family, let's say, and they were executed and so on, many people probably say, what the world happened here? I have no idea. But God wanted to understand you went into a covenant agreement together. So to solve the thing, we're going through it together. And that this people that I have called my peculiar people all answered to me. Not one, he said, but all answered to him. It said, and they took him out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto all the children of Israel and laid, out, uh, and laid them out before the Lord. When he said took them all out, that's the whole entire family was taken out. This is why I surmise that, you know, his family probably was involved in this. Mm -hmm. If they were innocent, could you see the Lord doing such a thing to them? But they were taken out along with him because it was hidden in his tent before the Lord. And verse 24 said, And Joshua and all Israel with him took a king, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them unto the valley of Echor. They took everything this man had. So basically, they're about to be banished from the tribe of Israel completely. Anything you had, in other words, you're being totally wiped off, you could say, the face of the earth here. It says, and Joshua said, why has thou troubled me? Anybody catch that? Ah, oh, there we go. Because keep in mind, it's not just one person involved. Everybody involved. Why would you do this thing? You have all that you have before you. God is taking care of us. But man often thinks of materials. He wants to be successful by having what? Money, by having goods. But in God's kingdom, money is, doesn't make you successful. Not at all. God is taking care of me. He said, why have thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. In other words, you rebelled against God. And by your rebelling against God, guess what? There's repercussions for your actions. And one thing about the punishment, it's like Donald Trump, folks. You can't choose your punishment. You know, you can't choose what your court date going to be. You can't choose the judge and all that thing. You committed wrong, guess what? You have to answer for it. And God, he says in there, God shall trouble thee. It says, and all the children, I mean, I'm sorry, and all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with the stones. So in other words, they were stoned to death, 
And then they were cremated, some would say. In other words, they burned them up because of their action that they brought upon themselves. And it said, and they raised um, over him a great heap of stones until this day. So the Lord turned from the feeling of his anger, wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Acre unto this day. In other words, they set those stones there for what reason? Why do you think they put stones there? Israel had a habit of always mounting up stones and stacking them up. What's the purpose here for that? There you go, Helen. They always did a memorial. In other words, this is a reminder of what can happen if you transgress against God, if you lie against God, if you steal against God, if you go against the commandment. In other words, by being disobedient, we call it what the lesson says, failure. So our first lesson dealt with a man and his family, I, I think I can safely add that in, who were disobedient. And by that disobedient, brought failure upon them. But the success part comes in also. What the success is, all the people got to witness it. So the way it lets us know that we better not go in this path or we might be in trouble. Because God pretty much told that to Joshua when he told him to correct the problem. He said, if you don't do something about this, guess what? I'm not going to be with you either. And immediately he said, something has to be done. So therefore, action was taken and action was taken swiftly. Because God did not want his people to be as the other nations were. God wanted to know that we're all in this thing together. When one suffers, we all suffer. He said, when one rejoice, also all rejoice. But when it comes to the suffering and pain and all these things, you don't have to worry about that. All God said, do one thing. Be obedient. You be obedient, guess what? You're going to have success. It's like I have had to, I don't call it debates, but people talk about the last days and the end days and the suffering and all this stuff, so on and so on and so on. And I know a little bit about that stuff. You know, I don't have it in the chronological quick order with some of the things I may speak about it. But I always come back to this one. I'm not going to call it a, a get out of jail card, but I come up with this one thing every time. I say, well, I'm not worried about that stuff. Because it's those who are non-believers got to go through that. Your child of God, guess what you're being? You're being raptured up. So you won't experience none of those things. But it's good for you to know what could happen if you're not what? Obedient. And that's the lesson dealt with. Now, lesson next week that we're dealing with moves from our cane to the old church saying here, boy, you hear this one a long time. A, a backsliding people. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a backslider, we call them. You know, a theological term they call it is a, it's a retrobate. In other words, one who now has, has slid back down the hill, as he would say. But this week we're dealing with that. And if you notice today, we went back to the book of Judges. I mean, back to the book of Joshua. Now we're going back to the book dealing with that of the times of the Judges. And we're coming out of Judges, the second chapter, verses 16 through 23. But as you can see, since they're probably dealing with around the middle of the chapter, it's best probably to read that whole chapter to get the full understanding of what the writer is speaking to us about when dealing with a backsliding people itself. Once again, that's Judges 2, 16 through 23. And don't forget to remind folks that first Sunday, we all have what we call uh, congregational Sunday school, where we are re asking that people will take time out of their schedule at least one time this year to come to church together as a people to see what Sunday school truly is all about. Because let's be honest, there are some folks that ain't been to Sunday school since they were in the beginning class. Mm -hmm. But you'll find that things are going here that you can't get over the pulpit. I mean, the pulpit can, pastor can preach this to you, but he had time to teach it. He'd give you the message and that same thing. You're like, I wonder what, what was that all about? Why did this happen? Well, in the priest's message, you won't get all that. You'll get some of it, but you have to come to Sunday school to get the breakdown of it. And this is why, something I'll tell you, we might not finish all the verses, but we get the understanding of what was going on at that time and what it was all about. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, once again, thank you guys for this coming to the lesson. And don't forget your homework or reading Judges to next week. But with that being said, shall we rise to our feet and we'll close out this part of the worship experience and move on to our worship service. And we're glad to have these uh, boaters back in town, Millie and Mike. <laughs> glad to see you guys back off your trip. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, let's have a word of prayer. Father, it's once again just closing out of what we call our Sunday school class. We thank you, dear Lord, for all those that have gathered here upon this morning. We thank you, dear now, Lord, for the guiding of the Holy Spirit and breaking down and the understanding of this word. And we hope, dear Lord, that we truly will learn something about the disobedient and failures of others, that it may guide us to be obedient and that of being successful. And now, dear Lord, as we're about to go into the worship service itself, we ask as always, dear Lord, you will bless all those that are here and those that are still on their way. Touch truly the pastor this morning, dear Lord, as he brings forth the word of God. Use him in a way and a manner that you see fit, dear Lord, that your word may go forth and preaching be made easy, that it may fall upon that of receptive ears. And dear Lord, we are careful as always to only give you and you alone the praise, the glory, and the honor thereby it. For it is in Jesus' name we give this prayer. 
Amen.